Okay, so welcome to this video on enriched category theory. I've been looking forward to making this video for a long time because I think that enriched category theory is one of the most useful and powerful theories in all of mathematics. I mean, it's no secret that I'm a big fan of ordinary category theory, but enriched category theory basically is a huge generalization of ordinary category theory. And once you know enriched category theory, it gives you the ability to easily understand lots and lots of other things in mathematics. So basically the idea in enriched category theory is that we look at the way that ordinary category theory is defined. And in particular, if we have a couple of objects, let's say A, and B, then in ordinary category theory, we suppose that there's a set of arrows from A to B. So let's call this set S. And basically, we then sort of think about set theory when we're talking about how to compose arrows. And so if I ask you, uh, what are the ways to go from A to B? In ordinary category theory, the answer would be a set of arrows, the set S. And what is S? Well, we can think of it kind of abstractly. We can say, well, there's this category called set, and S is an object in that category. And basically what we do in enriched category theory is we generalize this. So we say, well, why does there have to be a set of arrows from A to B? What about instead if we had some sort of more general category M? and that S is going to be an object in that category M. And this is the sort of game we play in enriched category theory. We're basically looking at the most fundamental thing in category theory, the definition of a category, and we're generalizing it. We're saying, well, does this all have to be built on set theory? Do we have to have sets of arrows? What about if we think about things more generally? And if you see my videos on topos theory, you'll know that you can get a lot of mileage out of trying to generalize what's happening in ordinary set theory. And so just for example, um, let's suppose we want to talk about something very simple in set theory. For example, we have some set, it has some element X, let's say this set's called A, and then we have some function F, which it goes from A to B. And we want to think about something like this function F operating on X. Well, we can make this all more abstract. We could say, well, we're working in the category set. A and B are these two objects in the category set. F is an arrow from A to B. We can pick out this element X by saying, well, we have the terminal object one. And um, then we have this point of A, which is called X. And we're talking about this composition here, which is F after X. And the nice thing about this is that once we get to this kind of level, we can think about a similar situation in another, ca in another category C, which has a terminal object. In fact, we could go further. We could suppose that this is a monoidal category M and that this is some object i, the could be say the monoidal unit of this category. I'll go through a recap of monoidal category shortly, but the idea basically is that we can look at a scenario in set theory, and then we can talk about a sort of generalization of it, which, you know, if we were working in set, it would be the same thing as this, but this could be something more general. For example, this might be the category of graphs. And, um, you know, A might be a graph, I might be the graph, which just has a single self loop. And these are graph morphisms and so on. Anyway, this is the basic idea of enriched category theory. The basic idea is we look at the way ordinary categories are defined in terms of their arrows and composition and so on. And we generalize it. So rather than having a set of arrows from A to B, 
we'll have some object in a category that's sort of a instead of a hom set of arrows from a to b we have an hom object of arrows from a to b and it's kind of like if i ask you the question well um what about going from a to b or how can i go from a to b um in ordinary category theory the answer would be well there's this set of arrows which is um you know each of those is a way for you to go from a to b but in enriched category theory you could answer that question in other ways for example if you're enriching for example if this category m that you're enriching over is something different to set like maybe this is um the category bool for example which has two objects uh, one called true and one called false then this um question um how can i get from a to b you're sort of answering it by saying well you can or you can't it's a sort of true or false kind of situation um or there's another case where we'll be thinking about the case where this um category we're enriching over is this category called cost which has objects as numbers and in that case we'd be talking about the cost of going from a to b so enriched category theory is extremely powerful um, it's also rather abstract but i'm going to try my best to um, explain it in a fairly down-to-earth way hopefully and um, basically it's really just well worth learning i mean it's it's almost like magic to be honest because it's it's just so powerful and it affords you the ability to have so many different viewpoints and it gives you the ability to look at things in so many different ways um it's just very very well worth learning so what does enriched category theory do for us well one thing it does is it gives us a way to think about higher category theory so it turns out that um, these definitions of two categories and three categories and so on make a lot more sense if you look at things through the kind of spectacles of enriched category theory basically the idea is that you can define a two category uh, by enriching over cat okay so rather than having a set of arrows from a to b we have a category um, from a to b so that's one thing we get out of this another one is this idea of um, levier metric spaces so this is a very beautiful idea which gives us a very interesting kind of way to think about metric spaces and generalizations of them um, using enriched category theory and so it's it's really very beautiful because what you end up with is a kind of structure which well okay at the beginning things seem very abstract but once you get used to them you're basically working in these structures which you can think about in terms of ordinary category theory and apply all of your kind of or at least most of your kind of intuition about ordinary category theory to them but they can represent very very different sorts of things for example you know we might have costs or distances from one object to another mm -hmm. and then a sort of um cost enriched categories we'll get to later basically could be thought of as a sort of generalization of a metric space something called a levier metric space and there are just so many other very powerful generalizations that you get out of enriched category theory i mean there's this sort of growing discipline of applied category theory which you know is all about applying category theory to different situations in science and in science and technology and so on and enriched category theory is often very very useful for that sort of thing the sort of situations where you don't just want to have sets of arrows from a to b maybe you want those kind of sets of our maybe you want some sort of uh, vector spaces or groups or maybe you want to have like pre-orders on your arrows or you know there's all sorts of extra kind of structure that you might want to attach to your arrows maybe you want to have numbers on your arrows like weighted sets or whatever an enriched category theory is the right kind of language for thinking about all these things 
and so I hope you're going to enjoy learning about them. Okay, so let's begin working towards this definition of an enriched category. So enriched category theory is sort of built on the idea of monoidal categories. And so I'm going to start with a quick recap of what monoidal categories are. And I think the fact that we're sort of basing everything on monoidal categories makes enriched category theory a little bit difficult to begin with because it's sort of built on a fairly abstract concept in itself, this idea of monoidal categories. But if you just keep in mind that this category set with its Cartesian product is an example of a monoidal category, then you'll be fine because that kind of idea can keep you grounded and it can make it so that you can at least understand examples of the different constructions until you get more comfortable and able to look at things in a more general kind of way. So let's just begin by recapping some things. So firstly, a monoid. What's a monoid? I'm going to go quite quickly now. Now, if you want a more kind of slow and in-depth introduction to the idea of monoidal categories, then you can check out my video, which focuses upon them. But just to quickly go through these ideas, firstly, what's a monoid? Well, I normally think of a monoid as just being a category which has a single object. Um, but what most people do is they think about the sort of set of arrows of that object, and they think of that as the sort of essence of the monoid, this set of elements which can be composed or combined together to form other elements. And um, this kind of composition of elements has to satisfy this uh, associative law, and it has to have this kind of neutral element I, which has the property that if we compose it with any element X, we just return that element X. So that's what a monoid is. And a strict monoidal category, this is a special kind of monoidal category, is just a kind of categorical generalization of the idea of a monoid. So with the monoid, we have this set of elements S and this kind of binary operation, this circle operation here, which is, you can say it's a function from the Cartesian product of S and S to S. And uh, basically with a strict monoidal category, we have a sort of similar setup, but um, what we have, but instead of having a set, we have a category M. And instead of having this kind of function here from S times S to S, we have a functor from the product of the category M with itself to M. And we call that functor circle times usually. And so this is giving us this idea of being able to take the monoidal product of things. And so if we have a pair of objects, A and A dash, then we have this other object, which is called A circle times A dash, or the monoidal product of A and A dash, or sometimes the tensor product of A and A dash. And we also have this special sort of object I uh, in this category. So I should be calling this category M, excuse me. Um, and I is an object in M. And basically in the strict case, we have that this circle times operation is strictly associative and that I circle times A is always equal to A. So this is the idea of a strict monoidal category. Is this what we want? Not exactly. We want to weaken these conditions a little bit. In particular, we'd rather change this to say isomorphic and these to say isomorphic and to have and this to be and this to say isomorphic. And we want particular isomorphisms to be there. Um, why do we want this? Well, think about the case with the category set, for example. So if you think about the category set, um, it has this Cartesian product operation. 
and it has this sort of special set, which we call one, the terminal object. But if you think about these operations, if you have these sets, capital A, B, and C, is it true that A times B times C is equal to A times B times C? Well, no, they're not actually equal. These sets are isomorphic, um, but they're not exactly the same. And that's because sets with this kind of structure, it's not what you'd call a strict monoidal category because these kind of things, the because these kind of equalities are not strictly holding. These things are the same up to isomorphism, and there are particular isomorphisms which make this kind of thing happen. So, in particular, if we have these sets A, B, and C, well, no, they're not the same, but they are isomorphic, and there's this sort of particular special isomorphism which can take you from these kind of elements to these kind of elements sort of um rearranging the brackets in these triples and so what we want is not what we call a strict monoidal category we want just what's simply called a monoidal category and this is a sort of generalization of this definition here so let's look at the idea now of monoidal categories in general and so here we are. This is the general definition now of a monoidal category. So what is it? Well, firstly, we have a category M. And we also have this functor here, circle times, which goes from the product of the category M with itself to M. So that basically means that, well, so that, so that means that if we have any pair of objects, A and B, we can speak about the monoidal product of A and B. Also, if we have arrows, F and G, we can speak about the monoidal product of those kind of arrows. And you can look at my video on monoidal categories if you want to see this sort of stuff unpacked in more detail. But yes, the first piece of information in a monoidal category is this monoidal product functor here. The other piece of information is this monoidal unit here, which is just a special object of M. And also, in addition to these things, we have some special kinds of natural isomorphisms. So these are basically what allow us to speak about the, associ the associativity and the idea that I is this kind of neutral element with respect to the monoidal product. Well, these natural transformations here allow us to speak about how that kind of stuff works because it doesn't work exactly. It works up to isomorphism. And so the final sort of piece of information behind a monoidal category consists of these three kind of um, natural isomorphisms, the associator, the left unitor and the right unitor. So basically what I'm saying is that the final part of the definition of a monoidal category is that we have these three natural isomorphisms, alpha, lambda, and rho, um, which have components of this sort of form. So these are all going to be little isomorphisms in M, and they have to make these diagrams commute. This diagram here, and this diagram here. Now, I'm not going to go into explaining kind of why these diagrams are so. You can, again, look at my video on monoidal categories if you want to see this kind of stuff unpacked in a more sort of systematic way. But what I do just want to say briefly is a very important example of a monoidal category, which is the category set. So in this case here, this circle times operation, um, this is going to send a pair of sets to their Cartesian product. And also, you know, if we have um, functions like this 
then there's going to be this sort of um, product of these functions. We could call it the monoidal product of the arrows F and G. And that's going to go like that. And then this sort of associator component is going to send A comma B comma C to A comma B comma C. Our monoidal unit in this case of set is going to be this set with a single element that we call star. This left unitor is going to send star comma A to A. The right unitor sends A comma star to A. And yeah, you can then check that these kind of diagrams hold. So yes, set is an example of a monoidal category, but it's not a strict monoidal category. And this is all we need to know to understand enriched category theory. Okay, so let, okay, so now let's get to the definition of an enriched category. So this is really the central thing in this video. So firstly, what we're going to do is look at the old definition of a category, and we're going to sort of look at it in a certain way. And then we're going to see how we can kind of generalize that to get this idea of an enriched category. So, so how do we define what a category C is? Well, it has a collection of objects. We call that ob of C. And then for any pair of objects, there's going to be this set C of A comma B, scripty C of A comma B. And this is the set of arrows from A to B. And sometimes this kind of thing is written as HOM A comma B, the HOM set, the set of arrows from A to B. And we want to think of the category in terms of these sorts of HOM sets because that's the kind of way we're going, because that's the sort of dimension of the thing that we're going to generalize. So how can we then define arrow composition in terms of these HOM sets? Well, how does arrow composition work? Well, we take an arrow F from A to B and an arrow G from B to C. And we end up getting this arrow G after F from A to C. And so we can see that the way that composition works is defined by this sort of function here which is going to take our arrow from A to B and our arrow from B to C and give us our arrow from A to C. So, and then the final piece of information that goes into a category is a description of the identity arrows, okay? So for every object A, there's a special member of this HOM set of arrows from A to A, which is called IDA. So we could just say for every A, there's this sort of identity arrow, which is an element of the set C of A comma A. Now, um, we want to write this a little bit more kind of categorically. So we're basically saying that um, this sort of identity arrow of A, this element of the set C A A, we can describe it basically as a arrow from the singleton set one into C of A comma A. So we can think of IDA as a sort of function which sends the single element star in this set one to this element IDA in C of A comma A. So this is just a fancy way of saying there's an identity arrow for every object. Well, okay, so this is the data that goes into the system but um, so, okay, this is the data which goes into a category, but we need this data to satisfy certain conditions. In particular, we want arrow composition to be associative and we want these identity arrows to be the sort of neutral elements with respect to composition in the sense that composing with the identity yields back the 
arrow that you're composing it with. So how are we going to express that? Well, we can do that by saying that there are a couple of diagrams that we want to commute. So firstly, we insist that this diagram here commutes. And basically, this is just saying that arrow composition is associative. So I'm saying we want this kind of diagram to commute for every A, B, and C. So let me just unpack this. What does it mean? Well, it means that if we have an arrow F from A to B, and an arrow G from B to C, and an arrow H from C to D, then the kind of two ways that we can compose those things end up giving us the same results. So going this way, so, okay, we start with um, a thing like this. And then going this way, this becomes something like this. And then we're composing these two. So we get this, and then we're composing those. So we end up getting, and then going the other way around, uh, this becomes H after G comma F, and then composing, we're basically insisting that this is equal to composing this way around. So this is just the uh, associative law. Okay, we're just saying that arrow composition is associative. And we're also going to insist that this diagram commutes here. And basically this just boils down to saying that composing with the identity arrow yields the arrow you're composing it with. So in particular, here we've got um, star comma F, where F is an arrow from A to B. And now we've got IDB comma F. And then we're composing these, so we end up with IDB after F. And this should equal F. And then this side is saying that this should equal F after IDB. Sorry, F after IDA. And uh, there we have it. That's our definition of a category, but kind of described in a sort of category theory friendly way in a sense. So, okay, we're actually now very close to having a definition of an enriched category. So all we're going to do is take this definition and just generalize it just a little bit. And we're going to end up with the idea of an enriched category. So what do we need? Well, the first thing we need, so what do we need? Well, the first thing we need is a category to enrich over. So let's suppose that we have any monoidal category, M. So it has a monoidal product, circle times, and a unit, which is called I. And so now we're going to talk about the definition of an M enriched category C, or we could just call it an M category for short. So what's an M enriched category? Well, the definition starts off the same. We have a collection of objects. So just before we generalize things here, let's just have a look at this statement here and think about how to write it in a little bit more of a kind of category theory friendly way. So in particular, what we're saying here is that for any pair of objects A and B, we have a set of arrows from A to B. So it would be fine if we just say this is an object of the category set, right? All we're saying here is that for any pair of objects A and B, we have this set, which we call C, A, B, the HOM set. So this is fine, but we want to generalize things now. So instead of having a set of objects from A to B, or another way of saying that is having a, 
object CAB of the category set, what we want to do is we want to have an object CAB in this monoidal category M. Okay, so this is our approach. Remember that the category set with its Cartesian product and its singleton set can be thought of as a monoidal category. And basically what we're doing here is we're looking at the definition of a category um, with respect to this sort of structure. And then we're replacing this particular structure with a sort of more general monoidal category. So where we see set, we're going to replace it with M. Where we see Cartesian product, we're going to replace it with a monoidal product. Where we see the singleton set, we're going to replace it with the monoidal unit. This is our strategy. Okay, let's carry on. So what else? Well, this is the this is part of the data that goes into an ordinary category. We're saying that for any three objects, A, B, and C, we have this composition function. And what is this? Well, this is going to be an arrow of the category set, right? But we want to generalize things. So instead of having this composition function, what we want now in our definition of an enriched category is we want to have a composition arrow and it's going to be an arrow of the category M, our monoidal category. And that's all we need. Except that here, we're not going to have the Cartesian product of two sets. We're going to have the monoidal product of two objects. Okay, so this thing here now we're talking about enriched category theory. We don't call this a HOM set anymore. This is what's called a HOM object. And it's an object of the category M. Now I know this stuff might seem kind of abstract when you first see it, but if it gets too abstract for you, just remember the connections with set theory. Think about the case where M equals set and that'll keep you grounded. So anyway, in general, in the definition of a monoidal category for any pair of objects A and B, we have this HOM object now, which is some kind of an object of M, which somehow represents something like a load of ways to go from A to B. And now instead of having this kind of function here, which tells us how composition works, now instead, we've got this sort of arrow here, which we could call circle ABC. And this is just going to be an arrow in our monoidal category M. Okay. And now the final piece of data we need in our, and, and now the final piece of data we need to define our M enriched category C is something like identity arrows. And so we're just going to generalize this statement a little bit. Now we're going to call this thing the identity element. And rather than being an arrow from the terminal object to C A comma A, this is now going to be an arrow from our monoidal unit to C A comma A. So remember, in the case where we have um, M circle times I, this monoidal category, in this case where this is set with the Cartesian product, our monoidal unit is this terminal object, this singleton set. And so it's this case here that we want to generalize. And so rather than having a one here, we put an I here. So that's it. That's all the data that goes into defining what an enriched category is. Okay, we have a collection of objects, just like usual. The only difference really is that rather than having a set of arrows from A to B, we have this sort of object of arrows from A to B called CAB. And we have one of those for every pair of objects A and B. And we have this sort of arrow here, 
which tells us how kind of composition works in our uh, enriched category. So this is um, this takes a bit of getting used to, I suppose, um, because it's it's very kind of general. We're basically saying, well, in the old setting, we used to have a kind of function that did composition for us, an arrow in the category set. Now we have an arrow in this enriched category M that describes how composition works. And finally, rather than having like these special points in the HOM sets C, A, A, now instead we have these kind of arrows from our monoidal unit into this HOM object C, A, A. And they're sort of picking out these identity elements, which are kind of stand-ins for what used to be the kind of identity arrows. So there we are. That's the definition of an enriched monoidal category, except that we have some extra conditions that we want to satisfy. Basically, we just want to have the kind of analogs of these sort of diagrams still commuting. So all we have to do is to just generalize our notation a little bit, and we're gonna end up with a couple of diagrams that we want to commute. And with those, we're finished, and we have a proper definition of a monoidal category. So remember how we're generalizing things here. Um, instead of having the Cartesian product of these HOM sets here, we're having the monoidal product of these HOM objects. And so we just have to modify our notation a little bit and we're done. And similarly here, we want these diagrams to commute. And so rather than having this terminal object here, we have this monoidal unit and the same over here. And again, we just have to turn our Cartesian products into monoidal products, generalizing. And these are HOM objects now instead of HOM sets. But basically now we're done, that's it. So these diagrams are going to be diagrams that exist inside the monoidal category M and we want them to commute. So this diagram is basically saying that we want to have a kind of analog or generalization of the idea of associative arrow composition and saying that this diagram commutes is to say that basically we want these identity elements to act like identity arrows, but in this kind of more general setting. So that's it. That's our, pro that's our full definition of an M enriched category. So let's just quickly go through it again, just to recap. So we start off with a monoidal category M, which has tensor product circle times and monoidal unit I. And what we're defining here is a structure C which is called a M enriched category. And so what does this kind of M enriched category C consist of? Well, it consists of a collection of objects and for any pair of objects we have, and for any pair of objects A and B, we have this special object C A comma B of M, which we call a HOM object and we have these kind of arrows inside M, which tell us basic, and we have these special arrows inside M of this kind of form, which essentially describe how composition works. So in particular for any A, B and C, we have an arrow like this inside this uh, monoidal category M. And finally we have an identity element, which is an arrow of M from I to C A comma A for every A. And we want this data to make these two diagrams commute. And that's it. That's the definition of an enriched category. Now, I think this is a lot to take in um, on first glance, but 
hopefully once we've had a look at some examples, this will get more familiar to you. I mean, you can already sort of pause the video here and look very carefully at the category set and make sure that it satisfies these kind of conditions. And I think that's a really good exercise to get used to this concept. Okay, so we have our definition of an M enriched category, or what we could just call for short, an M category. And we've seen that ordinary categories can then be thought of as set enriched categories or set categories. So basically, the way we came to this definition of an M enriched category was to think about an ordinary category, how it's described in terms of set, and then to replace set with a more general monoidal category M. So in the case where M equals set, we recover our original definition of a category. And so we can say that an ordinary category is a set enriched category, but we can then consider other kinds of enriched categories for other monoidal categories M. And we can refer to M as the base of enrichment. So we can think about what happens when the base of enrichment M is equal to set, or we can think about other cases. So now let's have a look at another case. This is a very simple one. So in particular, we're going to take a look at this category here, the category that just has two objects and a single arrow plus the identity arrows. Um, and the arrow goes from one object to the other one. And this is the category that we call bool. And it turns out that bool can be thought of as a monoidal category. And so we can think about what happens when we enrich over bool. We can think about what the nature of a bool enriched category is. And this is gonna end up being very pleasant. And I'll tell you the kind of um, big reveal, which is basically that a bool enriched category is the same thing as a pre-order. Okay, so this is going to give us a very interesting kind of different way to look at the whole theory of pre-orders. So let's remind ourselves what a pre-order is. Basically, a pre-order is just a category where we have at most one arrow from one object to another. So we never have this kind of thing where we have like two distinct parallel arrows going from one object to another. So that's what a pre-order is. And usually when we have a pre-order, if there is an arrow from A to B, well, there can only be one. And in that case, we usually write A less than or equal to B. So this is a sort of notation we use in a pre-order to say that A is connected to B. And for any A and B, either A is less than or equal to B or A is not less than or equal to B. So either there is a single arrow or there are no arrows going from A to B. That's the nature of a pre-order. It's just a category like that. Um, and then bool here, this is a special kind of pre-order where we just have these two objects and we call these objects false and true. And we have that um, false is less than or equal to true. And when we're working in bool, um, sometimes I like to write this um, kind of double arrow, which I usually interpret as meaning implies for the presence of arrow. So we could, so basically what I'm trying to say is that in bool, if we have a couple of objects, A and B, if there is an arrow from A to B, we'd usually write that you know, using pre-order notation as A less than or equal to B, but it sort of makes sense in bool to write this as A implies B because we have that false implies false because there's an identity arrow, false implies true, um, and true implies true, but true doesn't imply false. So we can think of an arrow in bool as corresponding to the sort of implication, if you like. Anyway, like I say, bool is a monoidal category. It's a pre-order and it's a monoidal category. That's a nice combination. In fact, 
monoidal pre-orders are a really good kind of place to start thinking about enriched category theory because they're pretty easy to deal with. So what is this monoidal product that we can give to our category bool? Well, basically, we can think of bool as our monoidal category M when we set our monoidal product to be AND and when we choose our monoidal unit to be true, okay? So AND here, you can think of it, if you like, as a function from the set of objects of bool um, times itself to bool. So it's a binary operation. And here's how it works. It's described by this table. So it's just logical AND. So AND of X and Y is true if and only if X equals Y equals true. And it's false of Y's. Okay, so this is how AND works on objects. And the way that, well, because this is a pre-order, we don't even really have to say how uh, this binary operation works on arrows because we only have this kind of trivial arrow, well, fairly trivial arrow structure. You can check that really bool, we do, you can check that really we do get a monoidal category here with this kind of structure. And it turns out to be a strict monoidal category. It's a good exercise to check if this seems unfamiliar to you. So now we've, so once we've convinced ourselves that bool really is a monoidal category, well, then we can think about what happens when we use it as a base of enrichment. In other words, what does it mean to have a bool enriched category? So that's what we're going to investigate now. So we just look at our definition of an M enriched category and just think about the case where M is equal to bool. So let's just go through our definition. What does a bool enriched category C look like? Well, firstly, it's going to have a collection of objects. That's no surprise. Secondly, for any pair of objects, A and B, we're going to have an object of bool, which is this kind of HOM object, C, A, comma, B. And since this is an object of bool, another way we can think of this is it's either going to be true or false. Okay. So there's only two objects of bool. One of them is called true, and one of them is called false. And so this C A comma B is either going to be true or it's going to be false. Okay. And where we're going with this is that we're going to see that a bool enriched category is actually just a pre-order. And so in a pre-order, if we have a couple of objects, um, either there is going to be an arrow from A to B, and in a and in a pre-order, if we have a couple of objects, A and B, either there is going to be an arrow from A to B, in which case we'd write A less than or equal to B, or there is not an arrow from A to B. So when you say... Um, what's the connect so in a bool category when you say what about going from a to b well the answer you get is either true or false either you can go from a to b or you can't there's nothing more to say um you know if you can there's only one way of doing it and if you can't there's no way of doing it so that's why these hom objects are either true or false in these bool enriched categories but let's just carry on because I think this is a very instructive sort of example. So what about this condition then? Let's have a look at this. It says that when we have three objects, A, B, and C, in our bool enriched category, um, we're going to have this arrow here of bool now Um, of this kind of form, which is telling us basically how composition works. So in this case, what this is saying is that it's saying that, remember our, and so, and so what does this mean in the case where M equals bool? Well, remember our monoidal product is AND. 
And so what this is saying is that C of B comma C and C of A comma C. And we're saying that there's an arrow in bool from that to C of A comma C. Now, what's it mean when there's an arrow in bool from one object to another? Remember, bool is just this. Um, remember, bool is just this pretty simple structure here, this preorder. And like I was saying, if there's an arrow in bool from A to B, we can just sort of interpret that as saying A implies B, because A and B are these kind of logical values. And the structure of bool is such that, um, you know, there's an arrow from A to B when this true or false value implies this true or false value. In fact, this is a necessary and sufficient condition for there to be an arrow from A to B. So, um, to say that we have to have an arrow from C comma BC and C comma AC to, whoops, that should be a B there. Let me start again. Um, to say that there should be an arrow from C comma BC and C comma AB to C comma AC is precisely to say that this logical value on the left has to imply this logical value on the right. So how can we interpret this? Well, it's pretty simple. What we're saying is that if A is connected to B, and B is connected to C, then A should be connected to C. That's all this boils down to, okay? Um, so what we're saying here is that, yeah, we have to have an arrow from this to this. And if we were working in a general monoidal category, we'd have to pick a particular arrow like this and show that it satisfies certain conditions. But because we're in a pre-order, uh, because bool is a pre-order, like there's only really one choice, it, 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 you know. So we we just want there to be an arrow from this thing here to this thing here, and that just means that this logical value here implies this logical value here. Okay, what about this next condition then? Um, what does this mean when we're working in our bool enriched category? Well, remember our monoidal unit here is true, and so we want there to be an arrow in bool from true to this object here. And that means we want true to imply this, or if you like, we want there to be an arrow in bool from true to this. But let's just have another look at the structure of bool. This is what bool looks like. And you can see that there's only going to be an arrow um, from true to an object if that object itself is true. So this is equivalent to saying that C A comma A equals true. So basically what all this boils down to is just the familiar kind of definition of a pre-order. So Basically, the way that we can interpret this is to say that if um, there's a connection from B to C and there's a connection from A to B, then there should be a connection from A to C. And what this is saying is that our relation is reflexive, if you like, or that C is always less than or equal, or that A, and basically what this condition is saying is that we always have that there's a connection from A to A. So if you want to say it in a bit more fancy way, this means that our relation is reflexive, and this means it's transitive. And this is just the definition of a pre-order, precisely. Okay, um, you could say, well, what about these? What about these diagrams? Like in a 
M enriched category in general, we want these diagrams to commute. And so, yeah, in a bool category, we want these diagrams to commute. Um, so we ought to look in bool and see, you know, is it true that this commutes? Is it true that this commutes? And it will be because bool is a pre-order. So there's going to be at most one arrow from here to here. And in fact, we know that there's an arrow because bool is a monoidal category. So all of the stuff that we're sort of making, uh, all of the kind of pieces that we're assembling this uh, diagram out of exist. So we know that these paths exist and we know that this kind of diagram has to commute because um, it's a pre-order. So we know that there's at most one arrow from any object to any other one. And in a similar way, we automatically know that this diagram is going to commute. So the kind of punchline here is basically just that a bool enriched category or a bool category is basically the same thing as a pre-order. So if you have a pre-order, you can think of it as a bool category. If you have a bool category, you can think of it as a pre-order. And I think this is really nice because as you'll see, there are lots of very kind of powerful ideas that we can use to think about enriched category theory. And those, and those can all be applied to these kind of bool categories. And so we can basically think of, and this gives us another perspective on what pre-orders are. So it's a very powerful kind of connection. And also this is our kind of second nice source of simple examples of enriched categories, right? We, we know now about set categories, they're just ordinary categories. Set enriched categories are ordinary categories. And bool enriched categories are basically pre-orders. So we have another great big bag of examples that we can look at and sort of use to get familiar with the definitions that we're playing around with. Okay, so our next example of an enriched category is one of my favorites because I love it when you can use category theory to get insights into geometry. And this way of looking at things is a really kind of unusual approach towards the theory of metric spaces. So basically the idea of metric spaces is, it's a sort of generalization of ordinary geometry where you say, well, I have a set and there's a distance defined on the points of these sets, defined on the points of this set. And this is a sort of function which takes a pair of points and gives you a number, which can be regarded as the distance between those points. And it has to satisfy various inequalities and so on. And so this kind of approach towards thinking about spaces, this notion of metric spaces is very powerful because you basically are studying aspects of geometry from a very sort of abstract and general viewpoint where you're basically saying, well, I'm only going to assume that I have some sort of distance function and I'm going to see what follows from that. And so your results end up applying to all sorts of different kinds of spaces and so on. Now, there's an approach in this sort of direction using enriched category theory, but it's very interesting because what we end up getting, what sort of enriched category theory suggests we should do in some sense, is to study what is a big generalization of the ordinary mathematician's concept of a metric space. Basically, we get something which is called a Lavier metric space. Now, um, before I show you how we get these Lavier metric spaces from enriched category theory, I, I think it's best just to actually tell you what a Lavier metric space is, because it's, it's actually a very, very simple kind of idea um, in its own right. 
and it can be studied kind of without needing to know any category theory. So what is a Lovia metric space? Well, basically it's a set S and a function from the Cartesian product of S with itself to the non-negative reals. Now we include infinity in there and we call this uh, function D, it's our distance function. And we just want it to satisfy two axioms. The first one is called the triangle inequality. And that's basically saying that the distance from A to B plus the distance from B to C ought to be greater than or equal to the distance from A to C. So the way that we can think about this is that um, if we have A, B, and C set out like this, and we're interested in going from A to C, well, we can always do that by going from A to B, and this distance here would be DAB, and then we can go from B to C. And this might remind you of composition of arrows in a category, and that's no coincidence. So basically, because we can always get from A to C like this, we know that the actual distance from A to C ought to be less than or equal to this plus this. That's the sort of origin of this triangle inequality. And then the final kind of axiom behind a Lovia metric space is that the distance from a point to itself equals zero. Now, those of you who know about metric spaces will know that there are several other conditions that ordinary metric spaces have to satisfy. So this is a sort of what you could call a generalized metric space. Now, um, it's very interesting because actually just looking at these kind of axioms turns out to be much more natural from a kind of category theoretic viewpoint. And there's some very interesting sort of um, aspects to these type of systems. I mean, we have this triangle inequality, which means that, you know, some kind of spatial features are reflected by these kind of systems. I would say that triangle inequality is a very kind of natural thing to have um, if you want to think about spaces. But notice that we're not assuming that the distance from A to B is equal to the distance from B to A. Now that's obviously a kind of weird notion from the perspective of ordinary geometry. But if instead of calling this thing distance, if we call it cost, okay, so um, if we say that the cost from A to B, but if we don't refer to this D thing as distance, if we call it cost, then it makes a lot more sense, I think. So imagine, for example, if you're on a staircase, now it costs more energy to go up the staircase than it does to go down the staircase. Or if you think about travel time when you're walking, um, it's going to take you longer to travel up a hill than it is to go down a hill, perhaps. Or if you think about the cost of moving around a country, there might be a a cheap train going in one direction, but not in the other direction, or think about plane flights and things like this. So anyway, this is the idea of Lovia metric spaces. Now let's see how they arise in enriched category theory. So it's all about this category, which we call cost. Okay, so what is cost? Well, it's a certain category, and it's the category we're going to enrich over and we're going to see that basically cost enriched categories are precisely the same thing as Lovia metric spaces. And cost itself is a very simple kind of category. Um, so the objects it has are just these non-negative real numbers, except that we include infinity as well. So this is the nature of cost. It, its objects are non-negative reals together with infinity. And what about the arrows? Well, it's a pre-order. So we have at most one arrow between any pair of objects. 
and we're going to have an arrow from A to B precisely when A is greater than or equal to B. Okay, so for example, if we have seven and we have three, well, seven is greater than or equal to three, and so there's going to be an arrow from seven to three. So this is a bit weird when you first see it, if you're used to pre-orders, because normally the way that we write about pre-orders is we say that there's going to be an arrow from A to B when A is less than or equal to B. But in this case, in cost, things are kind of working in the opposite direction. And in fact, some people call cost zero comma infinity op to sort of indicate that the arrows are present in the opposite direction to what you would expect. But you don't need to worry about that. This is just the definition of how the arrows in cost work. So cost is a pre-order. It's objects as non-negative reals, arrow from A to B when A is greater than or equal to B. It's, we can also think of cost as a monoidal category, which is good because we want to enrich over it. So what is the monoidal product in this case? Well, in this case, the monoidal product just corresponds to numerical addition. We only have to define it on the objects, as in these non-negative reals, uh, because it, that we can then infer how it has to work on arrows because we're working with a pre-order. Um, and so basically, the way that this... Um, and so basically, the way that this monoidal product plus works here is that if we take a couple of objects, as in a couple of numbers like A and B, then the monoidal product of them is just their numerical sum. And we also have a monoidal unit, which is the neutral element with respect to numerical addition, which is, of course, zero. And so there we have it. This is our pre-order that we're going to enrich over. So all we have to do now is look at what the nature of a cost enriched category is. So this is pretty straightforward. We'll just look at our general definition of an enriched category. And now we're just going to see what happens when this base of enrichment M here is equal to cost. So what is a cost enriched category C? Well, firstly, it's gonna have a collection of objects. And Secondly, if we have any pair of objects um, of C, then we're going to have this thing that we call CAB. Now, this is going to be an object of cost. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that this CAB thing here, this HOM object, is going to be a number. Okay. In fact, the way we should think of this is we should think of this as the distance from A to B or the cost of going from A to B. And we know, the so now we know the nature of the objects of C, they're just points, and we know what these HOM objects look like, they're just numbers, distances. Let's have a look at the other kind of things we need to hold to have an enriched category. So this is maybe the most interesting one. It, it says that if we have three objects, A, B, and C, then we're going to have this arrow of cost, which has this kind of form. So remember that cost is a pre-order. And so what we're saying here is that we're gonna have an arrow in our pre-order from this object to this object. What is this object? Well, this is just going to be C of B comma C plus C of A comma B. And we're going to have an arrow from that to C of A comma C. But now remember when it is that we have an arrow from one object to another in cost. That happens precisely when the first object is greater than the second object. Do you see where this is going? And also remember that what we're thinking of this CAB as 
is we're thinking of it as a distance. So this is the distance from A to B. This is the distance from B to C. This is the distance from A to C. And look at this. What is this? It's exactly the triangle inequality. Okay, so I think this is an amazing um, kind of discovery of Levere that basically, um, if you're looking at cost enriched categories, this sort of composition law turns into the triangle inequality. And what about our identity elements? What do they look like? Well, in this case with cost, our monoidal unit here is zero. And we're saying that we want to have an arrow from zero to CAA in cost, which means that zero is greater than or equal to CAA. But we know that CA comma A is a non-negative real. So we know already that CAA is greater than or equal to zero. So if it's greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to zero, well, that means it's equal to zero. And this is the distance from A to A. And there we have it. So if we write S, and there we have it. So if we just say, well, our set of objects of C, let's call that S, and we'll use the kind of shorthand that this HOM object CAB will write that as the distance from A to B. Well, we see we have exactly this definition here of a Levere metric space. And that's it. A Levere metric space is precisely the same thing as a cost enriched category. We have that the distance from a point to itself is zero. That comes from here. And we have this triangle inequality. And uh, there it is. And that's all there is to it. I mean, you could say, okay, well, we're looking at a enriched category here. So yes, we have to have this data that we've just gone through, but what about those diagrams that are supposed to commute? Well, once again, just like the case in Bool, those diagrams are living in a pre-order. Cost is a pre-order. And so those diagrams automatically commute. We don't have to think about them. Um, and so yes, a cost enriched category is precisely the same thing as a Levere metric space. So let's uh, think of an example now of a cost enriched category. Um, and let's take the unit circle. Okay, so in this case, we're going to have the S is equal to the set of pairs of real numbers, such that x squared plus y squared is less than one. Let's take the unit disk. And we can have that the distance from x1, x2 to y1, y2 is given by the Pythagorean metric. Like so. And there we have it, a, a very kind of, um, and there we have it, this very kind of familiar notion of our, and there we have it, this very sort of familiar notion of the unit disc. And we have the points in here and we have the sort of distances between them. This is an example of a cost enriched category. But cost enriched categories are much, much more general than this. But cost enriched categories are much, much more general than this, particularly because our kind of distance function doesn't have to be symmetric. And so this really opens up a whole new world of different kinds of space like systems that we can think about. And the really beautiful thing about all this is that there's a lot of concepts in enriched category theory. And basically there's loads and loads of things which 
we can study about these enriched categories, for example, these cost enriched categories, and we can apply all sorts of machinery from enriched category theory to look at them and discover all sorts of new ideas which apply to all these generalized spaces that we can look at in this kind of way. Okay, so one good reason to study enriched category theory is to get at high dimensional category theory. So we know the ordinary idea of a category is that we have a load of objects and we have arrows between those objects. And so we can call those objects zero cells because they're sort of like points. They're sort of like zero dimensional entities. And then these arrows that go between these zero cells, we can call those one cells. Now, the idea in higher categories is that we go further. So when we have two parallel one cells, as in we have two one cells, which go as in when we have two one cells that have the same source as each other and the same target as each other. Well, in that case, there might be a so-called two cell that goes from one to the other. So you can think of a two cell as an arrow between arrows. And this is what you have in a two category. So very roughly speaking, a two category has zero cells, one cells and two cells the two cells go between parallel one cells. And we can compose these two cells head to tail. And also if we have two cells like this, then we can compose them horizontally. So we could, for example, compose this one and this one horizontally. And we'd end up with a two cell that goes from this composition here of these two arrows to this composition here of these two arrows. So something like this. So this is the ba <clears throat> So this is the basic idea of horizontal composition of So this is the basic idea of horizontal composition of two cells. Um if we do the kind of ordinary composition of these one cells, uh, G and F, we get G after F up here. Similarly, down here, we can get G dash after F dash. And then if we horizontally compose uh, beta and alpha, we can get beta to alpha like that. And that would be the horizontal composition of these two cells. Now, You'll probably have seen this before if you've seen my videos on natural transformations. So it's possible to think of cat, this category which has objects as categories and arrows as functors. It's possible to think of that as an example of one of these two categories, meaning that we can think of the zero cells as categories the one cells as functors and the two cells as natural transformations. And if you look at um, the way natural transformations work, the way that we can vertically compose them and horizontally compose them, and the way they have to satisfy the interchange law, basically in general two categories, very similar kinds of things have to happen, okay? We we have to be able to horizontally and vertically compose two cells. They have to satisfy this interchange law. Um, and also, if you think about cat, um, if you pick a couple of categories, A and B, and you look at the functors from A to B, well, they form a category, okay? There's this functor category, it has objects as functors from A to B, it has arrows as natural transformations between such. And so in CAT, rather than just having a set of arrows from an object A to an object B, we kind of have a category from object A to object B. That's the functor category in CAT. And more generally in two categories, if we pick an object A and an object B in a two category, well, that means 
and then we look at the stuff that goes from A to B. Well, we have a load of one cells going from A to B, but we have two cells between them. And basically then we can think of the one cells as objects and the two cells as arrows and that stuff forms a category. Okay, so generally in two categories, we can kind of think that if we pick a couple of objects, there's a sort of category of things that goes from the first object to the second object. We have the one cells from the first object to the second object um, and the two cells between those. And we can think of those one cells as objects and those two cells as arrows between those objects in this kind of category that represents the stuff that goes from A to B. So there we are. That's um, that's the idea of two categories in a nutshell. Um, now I'm being very brief here for a couple of reasons. One is that I'm really supposed to be talking about enriched category theory today. And secondly, you can basically think of a two category as exactly the same thing as a cat enriched category. Okay, um, so here cat is the one category that has objects as categories and arrows as functors. And if we use cat as our base of enrichment and we think about what a category enriched in cat looks like, it's exactly the same thing as a two category. So actually, I think this is a really kind of economic way to define things because, you know, we know enriched category theory. And so, you know, we, we just use it to get our definition of a cat enriched category. And it turns out to be just the same thing as a strict two category. Okay, so let's now have a look at another kind of enriched category. And this is another one that's really interesting. It's really interesting for sort of getting at higher category theory. And I think this kind of approach using ideas of enrichment really makes the definitions of higher categories look very natural. So let's recall that there is a category which is called cat. The objects of cat are categories and the arrows of cat are functors, okay? Um, we know how to compose functors and we're just going to think of that as the structure of cat. We're not going to worry about any high dimensional structure. We're not going to worry about the two cells. We're not going to worry about the natural transformations. Let's just think of cat as an ordinary category. It has objects as categories. It has arrows as functors, and that's it. Now, let's remember that it can be thought of as a monoidal category. Okay, in particular, there is this notion of being able to take the product of things. Uh, to be more precise, cat has products. If we have a pair of objects in cat, then the kind of categorical product of those objects is defined. And um, what that basically means is that if we have a couple of categories, A and B, then there's another category which we can call A times B. And we recall how that category is structured. Um, in particular, if F is an arrow of A and G is an arrow of B, then F comma G is an arrow in this category A times B. And it goes from this object A comma B to this object A dash comma B dash in this example. And so we can know the structure of, and so we know how products work in CAT. And this um, method of um, forming the product of categories is actually just an example of categorical products. 
uh, working in this uh, category cat. And so we can use the ordinary tricks um, to define the product of functors as well. Okay, so in particular, if we have a functor capital F from big A to big A dash, and we have a functor capital G from big B to big B dash, then we have this functor, which we can call capital F times capital G. And basically, it, it everything just works sort of pairwise as you'd expect. So we're going to have the F times G operating on the object A comma B is going to give us F of A comma G of B and so on. So what I'm trying to say with all this is basically that cat can be thought of as a monoidal category. We have this way of taking the product of things. Um, we can take the product of two categories, two objects of cat. We can take the product of two functors, two arrows of cat. Um, so yeah, we have this sort of um, product operation, which we can actually think of as a monoidal product. And what's the unit? Well, it's just going to be the trivial category, the category which has just one object, which we'll probably call star. And there's a single arrow from star to itself, which is the identity of star. And so this is what one is. This is, the term, this is a terminal object of cat, and this is our monoidal unit. So yes, cat itself is a monoidal category. Okay. So then we can ask ourselves, what happens when we enrich over cat? What happens when we use cat as our base of enrichment? And so let's do it. We're interested now in what is a cat enriched category C. So what is it? Well, it's going to have a collection of objects. And then for any pair of objects A and B, we're going to have this HOM object, CAB, and that's going to be an object of CAT. So what does this mean? Well, if instead we were working with ordinary categories, we would have a set of arrows from A to B. But now instead we have a category of arrows from A to B. So if we have a couple of objects, A and B, these are objects in our category C, then what we have here is actually a category from A to B. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. What we're saying now in this case here, where we're thinking about what it would mean for C to be a cat enriched category, what we're saying is that for any pair of objects A and B, rather than having a set of arrows from A to B, we have a category from A to B. And so how are we to think about this? Well, let's think about a particular example. Let's suppose that this CAB, just in this example, is this category here that has, let's say, objects one, two, and three, and arrows U, V, and V after U, like this. Okay, so let's consider this case. So how could we sort of visualize this? Well, basically we can think of it um, so that the kind of objects of CAB, let's visualize those as one cells that go from A to B. So here they are. Uh, we've got one here and two here and three here, and then the arrows in CAB, let's visualize those as these kind of two cells, which are sort of like arrows between parallel one cells. So here's U and here's V, and there's going to be their composition here as well. V after U. And so this is the sort of picture we can have in mind now. 
basically a cat enriched category. It has its objects like A and B and C and so on. But rather than in the ordinary case, just having a set of arrows, say from A to B, instead we have a category of arrows from A to B. So that means that, yeah, we have kind of like elements uh, that go from A to B. They're like our one cells, um, but we also have arrows between them. And they're these sort of arrows between parallel one cells. They are our two cells. And similarly, we're going to have a category that goes from A to C. And then we're going to have a sort of composition law like this. And what this kind of composition law basically ends up saying is it says that, well, if you have a one cell that goes from A to B and a one cell that goes from A to C, you can compose those to get a one cell from A to C. But also, if you have like a two cell like this and a two cell like this, then you can do the kind of horizontal composition of those two cells to get another two cell, one that goes from this composition here, one that goes from this arrow here that you get from composing these two to this arrow here that you get from composing these two. So if you take a look again at the way that horizontal composition of natural transformations works, this is essentially just a sort of generalization of that kind of notion. Okay, and now the final kind of piece of data that we need is this identity law here. So what does this mean? Well, what this is just saying is that if we have any object in C, then we're going to want to have this arrow here in cat, um, which goes from, which goes from our trivial category to CAA. And so what's this saying? Well, it's saying that we ought to have this functor from our trivial category to CAA, which is basically sort of picking out identities for us. And what this ends up meaning, if you look at the other diagrams that have to commute and so on, is basically that there ought to be a special one cell, um, which turns out to correspond to the image of this kind of object star under this ID A thing here. Um, and this special kind of one cell from A to A is the identity one cell of A. But also, you know, there's going to be an identity arrow of star. ID A sends that to a endomorphism of 1A here. And that's going to end up corresponding to the sort of identity two cell of this identity one cell. And that's what I'm drawing with this red kind of dotted arrow here. And so basically that's it. That's what a cat enriched category is. Um, now in this case, um, we're not working with a pre-order. Now in this case, we're not working with a pre-order and so it is important that these diagrams here have to commute, that uh, this one here has to commute and that these have to commute. And what these end up meaning, well, basically this law here tells us that horizontal composition has to end up being associative. So that's horizontal composition of one cells and two cells. So one of the kind of consequences of that is that if you ignore the two cells, basically you have something that looks like a category. And then this law here basically says that our identity, one cells and two cells, play the games that they're supposed to play. And so in these kind of two categories, and so in these kind of two categories, we can do the kind of horizontal composition of two cells, basically, by applying this kind of functor here, but we can also compose these two cells vertically. And that would just correspond to sort of composing a couple of arrows in this category C, A, B, this HOM object of cat here. 
Okay, so we've seen that the idea of an enriched category is pretty useful. And of course, since we like category theory, when we learn about some kind of mathematical object, we want to know what kind of arrows there can be between such objects. And so we want to know then what's a M enriched functor going to be? What's it mean to have a functor between enriched categories? So let's go through the general definition of that now. So we've got our monoidal category M, some general monoidal category, and, and let's suppose we have an M enriched category C and another M category D. And so what we want to understand is what it means for there to be an M enriched functor or M functor T that goes from C to D. So what does that mean, basically? This is what we want to define. So it's the same kind of idea as before. We basically think about how an ordinary functor is defined, but we do it in this kind of way so that we are able to generalize from dealing with sets of arrows to HOM objects, okay? So, Firstly, let's just think about what an ordinary functor consists of. If, if we're dealing in the case, let's say, where M is set. Okay, so what's a set enriched functor T from a set enriched category C to a set enriched category D? Well, um, in other words, what's an ordinary functor T? Well, firstly, there's going to be a function from a set of objects of C to the set of objects of D. And we'll just call that function t. This is what we often do with functors. We use the same letter of the functor to define the kind of function that operates on the objects. It's just shorthand, essentially. The other thing that we do is we can, is the other thing we do with our functor is we map the arrows of C to the arrows of D. So what does that mean? Well, in this kind of ordinary kind of set enriched case, that means that, well, we have, let's say, a pair of objects A and B in this category C, and then we have this set C, A, B of arrows from A to B. And each of those arrows, let's say K, is going to get sent to an arrow from T, A to T, B, which we'd call T, K. All right, so basically, what we're specifying here is a function from the set of arrows from A to B to the set of arrows from T of A to T of B. Or if you like, we're talking about an arrow in the category set of this sort of form. Okay, fine. So now let's go back to the general case, the case where we're, where M is just some monoidal category. So what's an M enriched functor then? Well, the definition starts off the same. We have a function from the set of objects of C to the set of objects of D. The difference here though, is that rather than having a function which translates the HOM set from A to B to the HOM set from TA to TB, now we have an arrow in M, which is an arrow which goes from the HOM object from A to B to the HOM object from TA to TB. And we need one of those kind of translation arrows for every pair of objects A and B in our M category C. And so that's basically just the idea. All we're really doing is generalizing from having a sort of map from HOM sets to HOM sets to having a kind of arrow in M from HOM objects to HOM objects. However, of course, we're talking about functors, so we want these kind of laws to hold. You remember the ordinary laws that functors have to satisfy. In particular, they have to preserve composition and identities. And we want analogous laws to hold for our M enriched functors. 
Uh, and those basically boil down to just saying, well, we want these two diagrams to commute here. So this first diagram basically says that the image of the composition should be the composition of the image. So let's just quickly remind ourselves what this would look like in set. So in set, let's say we have F from A to B and G from B to C. And then if we go along this step, that means we're applying our functors to these arrows. So now we have TG and TF. And now we're composing those together. So we have TG after TF. And going this way around, first we compose. So we get GF, and then we apply our functor to that arrow. So we end up saying that this thing here has to equal T of GF. The image of the composition is the composition of the image. Um, but of course, we suppose that this kind of diagram commutes more generally. So we get a sort of generalization of that ordinary kind of functor law. And then the other thing we want is that the functor preserves identities. And that's just to say that this diagram commutes here. So over here, we've got, well, basically this ends up saying that doing the functor T on IDA gives us the identity arrow of T of A. Um, except that, you know, this is a more sort of general enriched version of that law. So there we have it. This is the idea of an enriched functor. And it's very cool because let's just have a look now. Um, we know what an M enriched category is, and we know what an M enriched functor is. And so what happens if we put them together? Well, it turns out that we get a category, okay? This is a sort of generalization of cat, okay? It's it's a category that it has objects as M-enriched categories, and it has arrows as M-enriched functors. And now let's just um, have a quick look back at what we've seen so far. So we can make a nice table like this. So, um, Let's just think about a few different possible bases of enrichments that we might use. You know, monoidal categories M we might want to consider. So what about if M is bool? Well, we've already seen that an M category in that case is just a pre-order. And what's an M functor? Well, it turns out to just be a order preserving function. The ordinary kind of idea of a morphism between pre-orders. What about if we take the case where M is cost? Well, then an M category is basically a Levier metric space. And it turns out that in that case, an M functor is just going to be what you might call a non-expansive function. So basically the idea here is that if we have a Levier metric space with a set of objects S and a distance function D, and we have another one with a set of objects S dash and a distance function d dash, then what's going to be a cost functor f from the first thing to the second thing? Well, basically, it's just going to correspond to a function f from s to s dash, which has the property that the distance from f of a to f of b is going to be less than or equal to the distance from A to B. Okay, so it's a sort of non-expansive function. It, it, doesn't ex it doesn't increase the distance when you apply it, basically. Um, so that's very nice. Um, what about if we take our base of enrichment as cat, the uh, category of objects as categories, arrows as functors? Well, 
then in that case, an M category is just going to be a two category, you know, a two dimensional category, strict two dimensional category. And it turns out that in that case, a cat enriched functor is just a two functor. And so it's very pleasant, I think, that all of these things fit together in this way. Okay, so these are very kind of, uh, well, rich ideas. And um, one really cool thing that you can do with them is get a kind of fast track to high dimensional category theory. So basically, well, okay. Um, we've already, we know what cat is, right? This category of categories. And let's call that one cat, okay? Because it's the category of one dimensional categories, okay? The arrows are one, di are one dimensional functors. Now, we've seen that if we enrich in one cat, then we get a two category, okay? So let's write that down. Uh, one cat enriched category is a two category. And a one cat enriched functor is a two functor. Okay. And so we can figure out what they are and then what we get is we get two cat. Two cat has objects as two categories and arrows as two functors. And we can figure out what those things are, as I've just said, using enriched category theory. And then what we can do is we can enrich in two cat. And what's a two cat enriched category? It's a three category. Okay, it has zero cells, one cells, two cells, and three cells, which go between parallel two cells, and so on and so forth. So we can inductively get our n categories. So if we think about n cat, the objects of n cat are n categories, and the arrows are n functors. And so then what's a n cat enriched category? Well, Basically, what that's going to mean is it's going to mean that um, a HOM object from A to B in an N cat enriched category is going to be an N category. And so if we have a couple of objects in our N cat enriched category, say A and B, then we're going to have this uh, sort of blob here going from A to B, which is going to be C A comma B. C A comma B is going to be an N category. And so it's going to have zero cells and one cells and all the way up to N cells. But in this picture here, these zero cells are actually really pictured as arrows from A to B. They're really thought of as one cells now. And so everything's getting pushed up by one dimension in this picture. Um, so now in this picture, um, the zero cells are actually just the objects of C, our um, NCAT enriched category C. And um, the one cells now are corresponding to the zero cells of CAB. That, so the zero cells of CAB are now considered to be the one cells from A to B and so on. Um, and so that basically we can see that this N cat enriched category C has, it doesn't have a set of arrows from A to B so much as it has a N category going from A to B. Um, so basically a, NCAT enriched category is the same as a N plus one category. And um, I'm just briefly sketching this idea, like 
it's a very nice exercise to work out the details. You could you could also check out Cheng and Lauder's nice book, Higher Dimensional Category, an Illustrated Guidebook. So if you download that PDF and do a control F search for Enrich, you'll find the section which describes how you can get it. The idea of N categories in this inductive way by keeping enriching over and over again, starting with cat. Okay, so I just want to very briefly just talk about one of my favorite ideas in enriched category theory. And I'm not going to go into full detail about it. Um, I could probably talk about it for um, a long time, but I just wanted to just um, show you this idea briefly and you can hopefully look it up in your own time because it's extremely interesting. I mean, basically, um, whenever you pick a base of enrichment, M, then you can study kind of M enriched category theory. And that's very deep. There's a lot more to enriched category theory than what I've covered so far. There are enriched natural transformations, enriched versions of all sorts of results and constructions. But what I think is one of the most interesting things is that each of these kind of worlds, you know, the world of M enriched categories for this monoidal category M and the world of M dash enriched categories for some monoidal category M dash. Well, these worlds are related and we can kind of hop from one world to another by doing a change of base. So basically, there are special kinds of ways of going from one monoidal category to another. And these are called monoidal functors. So basically, a monoidal functor is like a functor from M to M dash, which preserves the monoidal structure. Now, there are different flavors of monoidal functors. Um, there are strict ones, which strictly preserve the way that the product and the unit work. Um, actually, um, to do this kind of change of base, you can get away with a weaker kind of concept, which is called a lax monoidal functor. Now, I'm not going to go through the full definition of a lax monoidal functor here. I'll just tell you the constituents of them. Um, so a lax monoidal functor from M to M dash here consists of a functor F from M to M dash and an arrow epsilon from I dash to F of I and a natural transformation mu with components of this sort of form. And these... Um, pieces of information have to make a couple of diagrams commute, which I'm not going to go through. Um, you can look them up on, if you just search um, NLAB lax monoidal functor, you can see the definition. Now, um, you can, if you like, just think about the case where these are identities. Okay, that's the idea of strict monoidal functors. Anyway, the point is that for each of these lax monoidal functors between a couple of monoidal categories, um, we can use that kind of thing to do a sort of change of base. And essentially, it gives us a way of converting M enriched categories into M dash enriched categories. Um, so very roughly speaking, what the idea is, is that if we take an M enriched category C, then we can form an M dash enriched category C dash. And this is sort of the result of changing base. And so what is the nature of C, of C dash? Well, it's going to have the same set of objects as C has, but the HOM objects in C dash are going to take this kind of form. So we're essentially applying our monoidal functor to the old HOM objects to get the new HOM objects. And so just to give you a very quick example of one of these changes of base, um, here's an interesting one. So remember cost basically has non-negative reals as objects, and we have bool, which has true and false as objects. Well, there's one of these monoidal functors F 
from cost to bool. And this one here, it's going to send every one of these numbers to false except zero, which it's going to send to true. And it turns out that this is a monoidal functor and we can use it to do a change of base. So we can use it to convert cost enriched categories into bool enriched categories. What does this mean? Well, it means that we can convert Levier metrics bases into pre-orders. And um, basically it works like this. So if we have a Levier metric space with a set of points S and a distance function D, then we can do this kind of change of base to get a corresponding pre-order. The pre-order has the same set of objects as S has, and we're going to have an arrow from A to B precisely when the distance from A to B was zero in the Levier metric space. So this is just one example of a change of base, but like this is a very deep theory. I mean, actually, um, I've talked about M enriched functors and M enriched categories. There are also M enriched natural transformations. If you put those three pieces of data together, you get a sort of two category, which is, um, you know, like you can think of cat as a two category. Well, you could call that set cat, but more generally you can get M cat, which is this two category that has objects as M categories, arrows as M functors, two cells as M natural transformations. And then when you do this change of base, that gives you a two functor that goes from M cat to M dash cat. So it's, it's quite sort of mind blowing really um, thinking about all the different things you can get from doing these sorts of changes of base. Now, um, a good um, place to learn more about this stuff, I highly recommend uh, chapter two of Fong and Spivik's An Invitation to Apply Category Theory, um, as particularly section 2.4 on changing the base of enrichment is very interesting. And uh, I also, I think... Kelly's book on enriched category theory is a really good source if you want to go further with this stuff. It, it's a bit laconic, but I mean, there are also lots of other good videos on YouTube about enriched category theory as well. Um, so I'll stop there. I mean, there's so much more to enriched category theory. It almost seems like a shame to do such a, um, such a brief kind of overview, but I know it's a pretty abstract kind of subject. So I think it's a good idea to start off with a few pieces and then look at how they fit together and then learn some more. But you can go much further with it. I mean, there's, um, you can make like enriched functor categories, products of enriched categories, enriched Yo needle lemma is very interesting. You have enriched ideas of adjunctions and uh, weighted limits and all sorts of really interesting things.